Hi, everyone. I'm Mark Mother. I'm with the Population Reference Bureau. I want to thank you for joining us today for this webinar on using the ACS to measure health insurance coverage. In today's webinar, we have Joanna Turner, Senior Research Fellow at the State Health Access Data Assistance Center, that's SHADAC, who is going to provide an overview of health insurance data in the ACS, how it fits into the context of other federal surveys collecting health data, and she'll provide some examples of how SHADAC uses these data to inform state health policy. Uh, then we'll, we'll have uh, Genevieve Kent Kenny, who's co-director and senior fellow in the Health Policy Center at the Urban Institute, present some examples of how she uses ACS health insurance data, along with some of the challenges in working with uh, the ACS coverage data. Uh, it's a very relevant uh, topic right now, very timely given all the, the uh, current policy debates. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Joanna. Thanks, Mark. And uh, thanks for inviting me to participate in today's webinar. So as Mark mentioned, today I'm going to be giving an overview of the ACS health insurance question, how it compares to other federal surveys that collect data on coverage, and some ways that SHADAC's uh, using the ACS to inform state health policy. But first, some context about SHADAC. So the State Health Access Data Assistance Center, SHADAC, is a multidisciplinary health policy research center based at the University of Minnesota. So the goal at SHADAC is really to bridge the gap between research and policy by providing assistance to states in accessing sound data and rigorous analysis in the areas of healthcare coverage, access, quality, and delivery system reform. So funding for our work is provided by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, and we thank them for their continued support. So to help inform um, health policy and monitor coverage, states do need reliable data. So consistent estimates and the ability to study trends over time are critical for monitoring and evaluating the Affordable Care Act. So many of the health reform provisions are implemented at the state level, so it's especially important that we're able to study factors like health coverage and demographic and economic characteristics at the state level. So there are several uh, key federal surveys that meet these needs and that can be used to monitor health insurance coverage. So they each have their own strengths and weaknesses when deciding which source is best for your work. So the ACS okay. is the newest survey that's added to the uh, toolbox of surveys that's available for study in health reform. Several states also do conduct their own surveys, but today we're really going to focus on the federal surveys. So the question on health insurance coverage was added to the ACS in 2008, so we have the full suite of products, the one-year, three-year, and five-year files, now with health insurance coverage. But prior to the ACS, the current population survey, the CPS, was really the most widely used source for estimates of health insurance coverage due to its long-time trend and the ability to produce estimates for all states. So as you can see from this table, uh, a weakness of the ACS for studying health is that the only health-related measures that are asked are about insurance coverage and disability status. But the great strength of the ACS is the large sample size. So if you look at uh, the map on the next slide, you'll see that the ACS is almost 15 times larger than the CPS, which allows us to study subpopulations and substate geographies. And this level of analysis just really isn't possible with the other surveys that are listed in the table. So going back to the table, as I mentioned, the CPS has a um, forward, sorry, Mark, has a long time trend, state level estimates from 1987 forward, but the sample size doesn't allow for as much uh, subpopulation analysis as the ACS, and pooling years is recommended when you're comparing states or looking at estimates over time with the CPS. Now, the Census Bureau did recently redesign the CPS health insurance coverage series to improve the measure of coverage and to add some new content, like a point-in-time measure. So the next slide is focusing on the other surveys that are listed here, the Survey of Income and Program Participation, the SIP, the National Health Interview Survey, the NHIS, the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey, the MEPS-HC, and the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System, the BRFSS. And these are also um, important tools for studying health reform. So from all the check marks, you can see that they provide great depth of health measures that include coverage, 
as well as access, use, and cost. But the SIP, NHIS, and MEPS HC don't provide estimates for all states. VBRFSS, the next slide, does show that the um, that they have estimates for all states, but it's only asked of the adult population. So choosing which survey is best for your research really is going to depend on the questions that you're trying to answer. And SHADEC does have a brief that provides more information about these federal surveys that can kind of be a tool to help you decide which survey might be best for your research. So it includes uh, some information on the survey content, design, sample size, how to obtain the estimates, and details on uh, recent revisions to better measure the effects of the Affordable Care Act. So now I'll go into some more specific information about how the health insurance um, is asked on the ACF. So this is the question as it appears on the paper mail form. So the same question is asked across all of the data collection modes in the ACF. So you can see that the question is asking about seven types of health insurance coverage with the option for the respondent to write in any other type of health insurance or coverage plan that they might have. Now respondents don't always mark each type of coverage, so the missing responses are assigned a yes or a no through editing and imputation. And during this process, the write-in responses are classified into one of those seven coverage types. So the write-ins are not available on the public use files. The health insurance question is asked of every person in the household, and it's asking about current coverage at the time of the survey. One thing I'd like to uh, note about the question is if you look at Part D, the Medicaid Medical Assistance, this is intending to capture all public means-tested health insurance programs, and it's not just an estimate of Medicaid coverage. So this category would include things like the state children's health insurance program. And another point about the uh, format of this question is researchers aren't able to separate out Medicaid coverage from other state public programs. So for uh, reporting purposes on the next slide, you can see that the Census Bureau broadly classifies people into private and public coverage. Private coverage includes employer-based, direct purchase, and TRICARE while public coverage includes Medicare, the Medicaid means tested public coverage, and VA. Respondents who only have Indian Health Service are uninsured, as this coverage is not considered comprehensive. Now, since respondents can select more than one coverage type from that list, it's possible that they're included in multiple categories. So if you add up the percentages across coverage types, it will be greater than 100%. So unlike the other surveys mentioned, the ACF surveys the entire population. On the next slide, you'll see this includes housing units, institutional group quarters, and non-institutional group quarters. Now for the health insurance coverage estimates, the Census Bureau restricts the universe to the civilian, non-institutionalized population in their published tabulations. And this does make the universe comparable to the other federal surveys that collect data on health measures. So when the ACS first added the health insurance coverage question, there were some concerns about how well the ACS would collect this information compared to the other surveys that have been collecting information on coverage for many years. So the ACS was the first federal paper mail survey to ask about health insurance coverage. Some of the other uh, major surveys, like the CPS and NHIS, use telephone or personal visits with automated instruments that do allow for greater customization than possible with the mail form. So Medicaid programs <clears throat> have different names in many states, and the other surveys have this name filled when the interviewer is asking the question. So for example, in Wisconsin, the respondent is asked about Badger Care, not just if they have Medicaid. And this can help the respondent identify their coverage and possibly differentiate between private and public. But with the paper form, it's just really not feasible for the Census Bureau to have a different version for each state. So another challenge of the paper form is the inability to use customized questions or wording for subgroups of the population. So for example, the CPS has specific questions that are aimed at children to ensure that coverage under the Children's Health Insurance Program is reported. 
So now, despite these challenges, the estimates from the ACS are actually pretty similar to estimates from the CPS and NHIS. And as you can see in the um, chart, that in 2013, the NHIS uninsured estimate is 14.4% compared with 14.5% from the ACS. The NHIS is asking about a similar concept, current coverage. Now, the CPS is actually asking about past year coverage. So were you uninsured for the entire previous calendar year? And we're not going to get into too much detail here, but researchers have found that the CPS estimate does tend to look more like a point in time measure. And the Census Bureau did modify the question series to improve this measure. So the CPS estimates on this slide are of that measure, the past year coverage. So in 2012, the uninsured rate was 15.4%, and it dropped to 13.4% in 2013 when the new modifications were implemented. The estimates are also similar across the surveys when looking at coverage by characteristics like age, gender, and race ethnicity. And they're also fairly similar by coverage type with the exception of direct purchase or non-group coverage, where the estimates are particularly high in the ACS. And Jenny Kenny will uh, discuss this briefly in the next presentation. So now I'd like to share some examples of how SHADAC is using the ACS data to help inform states. So one of the primary goals of SHADAC is to provide technical assistance to states. So we cover a variety of research areas. And when we're working with federal surveys like the ACS, we conduct research to better understand the survey's strengths and weaknesses and convey this information to the states. We also pro uh, provide a variety of products from custom analysis to issue briefs and journal articles to help inform state policy. So at TRADAC, we access the ACS data for many points depending on the particular research or policy question that we're trying to answer. So on the next slide, you can see that we use the pre-tabulated estimates that are available from American Fact Finder, as well as the public use files. And we've also worked on a project that uses the restricted data in a census research data center. So I'm going to briefly go through examples of how we use data from each of these sources, and more information on the project is available on ShadeAct's website. Uh, so starting, I'll start talking about a project that we worked on with the Census Bureau using restricted data in a research data center. And we're really fortunate that we have a census RDC that's located at the University of Minnesota and pretty close to ShadeX offices. So federal and state surveys tend to undercount the Medicaid population when compared with counts of Medicaid enrollment in, in administrative data. So extensive research has been conducted on this topic in other uh, surveys, but there was particular concern about how well the ACS was capturing the Medicaid population given the restrictions of using the paper format. So what we did was extend this extensive you know, past research to the ACS. So we linked the ACS data with Medicaid records from the Medicaid Statistical Information System, and we looked at how people that were listed as enrolled in Medicaid answer the question on the ACS. So of interest is that box with the check mark. So according to administrative records, the respondent has Medicaid coverage, but they don't indicate this coverage in the ACS survey. We did find that despite the design differences in the question, Medicaid reporting is in line um, in the ACS with results from the previous research on the other federal surveys like the CPS and NHIS. But Jenny Kinney is going to discuss this a little bit further, and I think briefly uh, give a description of some edits that the Urban Institute makes to, the, uh, to adjust for the undercount. So we also use estimates from the American Fact Finder table. If we're interested in looking at lower levels of geography, like counties or zip code tabulation areas, or for smaller uh, subpopulation analysis. So this map is showing an example of work that we did for the state of Minnesota. They were interested in the distribution of the uninsured and characteristics of the population within the state to look for people potentially eligible for health insurance in the marketplace. So this map is showing um, an interactive map of counties in Minnesota. And if you're using it interactively and click on a county, it will bring a pop-up of detailed estimates 
That also includes uh, indication of reliability that's based on the relative standard error. So in this example, we're just looking at estimates for Hennepin County, where ShadeX is located. And the user is able to drill down in this map to look at zip code tabulation areas. So the next map is providing the same information, just at a lower level of geography. And it's really nice for the user to be able to access many relevant estimates from an easy to use interface. You know, without a map, the zip code level data can be pretty overwhelming if you're trying to look at it in, say, a spreadsheet. So at Shadec, we also do a lot of our work with the public use files, since this allows us to customize the analysis. You know, a kind of simple example is if you'd like to tabulate estimates for children 0 to 18, instead of using the 0 to 17 age break that's available from AFF. So we work with the PUMS files, which allows us to create policy-relevant measures for the definition of poverty and family. So we use the poverty guidelines as opposed to the poverty thresholds that are provided on the file by census. The guidelines are issued by the Department of Health and Human Services, and they're used for administrative purposes, such as determining program eligibility, so they're more relevant for our work. We've also created a health insurance unit definition of family. What this does is it groups people into family units that are based on likely eligibility for health coverage instead of using the census definition of all related people in a family. So the next slide is showing an example of a HIU versus a census family. So if you look at the figure on the right, you see a household that's composed of grandparents, a married child, and a grandchild. So census groups all of these related people together, so everyone in this household is considered a family, and that's used in terms of calculating income, etc. What Shadex HIU does is we separate this into two families based on likely eligibility for health coverage. So the grandparents are one family, and the married child and grandchild are another family unit. Now we've made these variables available through the integrated public use microdata series, IPUM, and the next slide shows uh, the links for all of these resources. IPUMS is based at the University of Minnesota, and it's a great way to access the data. If you aren't uh, familiar with IPUMS, what they do is they take the census PUMS files and they harmonize the variable names, coding schemes, and documentation. So it's a free and pretty easy way to work with census data. Uh, we also provide the SAS and SATA code for the Shade Act created variables, as well as some examples for how you can work with these variables that are available through IPMS. So at Shade Act, we use the FPG and HIU policy rele relevant variables to tabulate estimates. And one way that we make them available is through Shade Act Data Center. So the next slide shows just sort of a screenshot of the, um, the home page for the data center. This is an online table generator that provides state-level estimates of health insurance coverage, as well as estimates of access to care, access to employer-sponsored insurance, affordability, cost, and utilization. So we have estimates from the ACS, as well as from the CPS, the BRFSS, MEPS-IC, and NHIS. So we developed the data center to be an easy-to-navigate resource that focuses more on the policy-relevant estimates. We actually redesigned our data center last year, so it has some great new visualizations. So we now provide the estimates through maps, bar charts, trend lines, and tables, so there's a variety of ways for states to um, explore their data. I'd also just like to mention that every fall, ShadeAct hosts a webinar with Census Bureau experts to discuss the latest ACS and CPS data release. The, uh, and there's a link to um, past data release webinars on the slide. So we cover the latest estimates, as well as any changes to the survey questions or methodology. So it's a pretty easy way to receive the latest updates on health insurance coverage in the ACS and CPS. And it also provides a chance to ask the uh, Census Bureau questions. So just to uh, summarize, like all surveys, the ACS has strengths and weaknesses for the health insurance coverage estimates. And one of the weaknesses that I haven't uh, mentioned yet but is important is that the ACS has not added questions related to health reform. 
So unlike surveys like the CPS and NHIS, oops, sorry about that, uh, the ACS, okay, so the CPS and NHIS have added questions on uh, health insurance exchanges or subsidies, and these have not been added to the ACS. This is being studied in an ACS content test, but not having this level of detail might reduce how useful the ACS is for studying health reform in depth by coverage type right now. But on the other side, not changing the questions has provided us with a really consistent set of estimates. We can study trends from 2008 forward, and the ACS is really invaluable for providing us the ability to study the impacts of health reform within states, both by subpopulations and lower levels of geography, and now I'm going to turn the call over to uh, Jenny Kinney, who's going to go through, I think, quite a few examples of how useful the ACS is. Thank you. Thanks, Joanna. Hey. Well, thank you, um, Mark, uh, for, for organizing this webinar and uh, Joanna for laying such a great foundation. Um, I am going to um, give a little bit of motivation for why we really added the American Community Survey uh, to our um, analysis and draw on it so heavily for the work we do. And that's new within the last um, five uh, or so years. Years. I want to provide um, a brief, very light touch um, to give you a flavor of some of the ways we use the American Community Survey. And then as Joanna said, I'm going to pick up on a couple of the challenges. I think she ended on just the right note in terms of um, a warning about uh, where to, to, to tread carefully with their uh, American Community Survey. Uh, so key advantages. As Joanna said, um, it, it really offers tremendous potential for tracking uh, changes and uh, variation in health insurance coverage uh, across uh, uh, the country and across subgroups um, and over time. Um, and uh, its ability to drill down uh, to important um, sub-state geographies um, and to look at important um, subgroups uh, that we often don't have enough sample to address in other surveys. Um, and um, it has, it, while it is a, a lean instrument, it has sufficient information uh, that we've been able to develop um, what we think is a, a, a really um, valid um, eligibility simulation to identify who's likely eligible for Medicaid or other public types of coverage, and uh, to adapt a microsimulation model that we've used to project coverage changes under different policy scenarios using the um, powerful data uh, that's available in the American Community Survey. So I'm going to. Uh, at the end, I've included a couple pages of references from Urban Institute research, not certainly not just my own work. Um, but as you can tell from Joanna's presentation, Shadak has, um, uh, you, you definitely want to look at the links that she provided. Uh, there's an enormously rich amount of applications of uh, ACS uh, coverage analysis um, that Shadak has done, and um, I would totally recommend looking at that. Um, but I want to make sure uh, that it's clear just how uh, big the sample is. Um, for um, the, uh, uh, on an annual basis, we're dealing with a sample um, that exceeds a, a 2 million cases. And um, because the sample includes, uh, is drawn uh, in every county in the country, um, it really allows you to have um, much uh, better coverage for local estimates than is possible uh, from other data sources. Um, so it's the reliable state estimates. Um, many more local estimates are possible. And um, small subpopulation estimates are, are um, feasible. And then as Joanna said, um, while we have our issues uh, in terms of concerns about measurement on the American Community Survey, it does have uh, the distinct advantage asking people to report on coverage at the point in time when they're filling out the survey. And we know from all the cognitive experts that that's the uh, much easier way to get credible information 
than trying to sort through uh, what might have been coverage changes uh, over the prior year. Um, so I want to start by, um, in terms of some examples, uh, with um, the um, national estimate uh, that we were able to put together of how many uninsured children were eligible for public coverage through Medicaid or the Children's Health Insurance Program, but not enrolled. And of the six, uh, or uh, close to six million uninsured children, we find that close to two-thirds um, are um, uninsured despite being eligible for Medicaid or CHIP. So that's an important statistic from a policy perspective because it indicates that more effective outreach enrollment and retention efforts could make a sizable dent on the um, number of uninsured children in this country. But this actually is not new information. We have uh, this data from our current population survey model. But what the ACS allows us to do is to drill down and look at this population uh, in ways that are really um, helpful from a policy perspective. So on a state, um, on a yearly basis, we can track where, it, in, in what states these children live. And um, so this is the first time that we really in, uh, could get a handle on the fact that um, over a third um, of all these eligible but uninsured children live in just three states, and 60% um, live in just 10 states. And so that's helpful from a, a standpoint of figuring out where the biggest bang for the buck is going to come from additional outreach um, efforts. Um, when we look at participation in Medicaid and CHIP among eligibles, we're able to track that for important um, subgroups of children defined by their uh, demographic characteristics and their socioeconomic um, status. Um, so here um, we're showing changes um, over the years by income, age, race, ethnicity, and I'll draw attention to the fact that you really can look at American Indian, non-Hispanic, uh, Asian, and, and that's really difficult from other data sources because you just don't often have the sample. And we've done work that have allowed us to look at those subgroups um, at the state level as well in states where uh, those smaller groups nationally constitute a larger share of the state population. Um, we've uh, done work that um, is like what um, Joanna shared that, that helps states understand variation in uninsurance within the state across re regions help um, cities understand uh, variation across neighborhoods, um, and um, provided a much better understanding about the variation in uh, take up of, of Medicaid and CHIP coverage. This shows for children, but we've done similar analysis for adults. Um, and what you can see is that there's tremendous variation um, at the state level, but there's also substantial variation within states. Um, the fact finder um, data source, uh, which is not the microdata that Joanna mentioned, is something we've used um, as well for certain purposes. In this instance, it was to look at uninsurance um, at the metro level, uh, and here um, to do so by congressional district. Um, from the point of view of the Affordable Care Act and the major changes that are occurring in uh, the Medicaid program and access to um, subsidized coverage, um, with our model and the, which is possible because of the data that are on the, uh, the American Community Survey and um, other resources that we bring to bear, we're able to assess um, to what extent um, the uninsured in different states qualify for Medicaid or subsidized coverage through the new exchanges. And you can see um, you know, significant variation across states, which track very closely with whether states have ex chosen to expand Medicaid under the Affordable Care Act or not, but also uh, which uh, reflects the extent to which the underlying uninsured populations um, are more um, composed or are more dominated by undocumented immigrants. So you see some of the states in the West that have expanded Medicaid have lower shares of their uninsured eligible 
for financial assistance, say look at California, uh, Arizona, Nevada, compared to uh, West Virginia and Kentucky, so you've got 60% versus 80%, and um, this data source really allows us to look uh, at that issue because we have enough uninsured individuals in every state uh, to be able to do that. Um, we're also able to project changes in coverage um, at the state and local level and, and, this, um, and, and do other kinds of policy simulation work. I'm just going to go through a couple that use our microsimulation model that tries to model the changes um, in the health insurance uh, market that will affect employers and consumers um, uh, that target health insurance coverage. And here we've simulated um, what we think the impact will be on the uninsured under the current um, status of state Medicaid expansion. Um, and then uh, we've simulated what the um, further impacts would be if, if the additional 22 states that have not yet expanded actually expanded Medicaid. And what you see is the MAC gets lighter and lighter and lighter pink. You have fewer and fewer areas um, that have high rates of uninsured. Um, but you still have some pockets uh, where the uninsured rate is over 20%. And that has implications for the residual safety net uh, that, that's going to be required in the coming years. Um, we're also able to look uh, and project coverage changes uh, for um, different race and ethnic groups under different policy scenarios. Um, uh, we're able at the state and local level to quantify how many uninsured um, are in the so-called coverage gap with um, uh, incomes that are too low to qualify for the federally uh, financed marketplace subsidies, uh, but not eligible for Medicaid. So it's the population below 100% of the federal poverty level not eligible for Medicaid, but is uninsured. Uh, and um, so this is helpful for, again, thinking about uh, the remaining uninsured, where who they're going to be, where they're going to live. Um, the ACS allows us to do um, work uh, at the metro level. I showed you some work that we did with the fact finder. This is with the micro data, uh, where we use our micro simulation model to look at the impacts on coverage and other outcomes. Um, at the, the city level um, to see what difference Medicaid expansion has um, at that level. Um, we've also done work projecting increases in coverage in Medicaid in particular uh, with um, the goal of helping um, states and local areas prepare for the service delivery, the pressures and pressures that will be placed on the service delivery system. And you can see here that the Medicaid expansion component plays out very differently depending on how large the Medicaid program is in a given state and local area to begin with, um, with some areas seeing very little increase in Medicaid coverage and others seeing uh, more than a doubling uh, in the Medicaid enrollment under Medicaid expansion. Um, and likewise, this shows um, how that would play out in Texas, um, uh, again, with an eye toward planning and, and um, considering service delivery implications. Um, so I want to close with a couple of thoughts on um, the, the challenges. Um, and they really are around coverage type, I think. And Joanne, I, I think, agrees with me um, that um, the, um, in terms of uninsured versus insured, the micro data that census puts out um, we think does a, a a really strong job of tracking what's happening there and how it varies across states and across groups. Um, the, um, when the new data, when health insurance was added to the American Community Survey, Shadak and urban researchers collaborated with census researchers to develop um, a set of micro uh, uh, data edits uh, that are reflected on the public use file. Um, but because our focus was on um, initially really trying to understand which adults, which children are participating in Medicaid and CHIP, which are taking up that coverage, who's not, where do they live, uh, we felt like we needed to uh, take a, a, a deeper dive on the question of how well the ACS was doing at capturing Medicaid and CHIP coverage for children and adults. In the case of children, we found that it was underreported. 
and that's not uncommon. Um, that that is um, a longstanding issue, and glad to talk about some of the underlying uh, drivers of that. But as a consequence, when we use the American Community Survey uh, microdata for our work, we uh, apply some additional uh, microdata edits um, that we think capture um, under this underreporting for kids. Um, and um, as a consequence, our um, uh, Medicaid chip uh, total is much closer to the administrative data total um, than um, what the raw um, microdata um, include. Um, on the adult side, we actually, uh, our analysis suggests that there may be some over-reporting of the extent to which people have comprehensive Medicaid coverage. Uh, you may or may not know that there's uh, historically been a restricted uh, benefit coverage for many adults in Medicaid, either family planning services or emergency services for some immigrant groups. Um, and um, so uh, some of the, uh, and, and Joanna helpfully showed the STEM question, it, it doesn't spell out what we mean by health insurance coverage. Um, and so as a consequence, we do some editing on the adult um, Medicaid reports um, that, uh, uh, to re that, that actually takes away some uh, Medicaid coverage. Um, but I think the bigger issue, um, and, and, that's, and, and those edits that we do, um, we, we've had done some validation work that um, suggests that they're getting closer to the truth. Um, and so we're, we're comfortable using them in our work. But, and we've also done a lot of work with other survey data, so we've benchmarked um, our estimates and feel like they're very grounded. There's internal validity and there's external validity to them. Um, I'd say the biggest, con bigger concern, I think, for the general population using the American Community Survey is over the um, estimates that um, come out from the microdata on non-group coverage, that is, coverage that's not provided uh, through a publicly public program like Medicaid and not provided through an employer-sponsored um, insurance plan. And the raw data um, from the microdata have um, uh, a share of people reporting non-group coverage, uh, which is much higher than the other uh, federal surveys that Joanna mentioned that we use all the time. Um, and um, work that um, one of Joanna's former colleagues from Shadak and co uh, folks at Census and uh, Victoria Lynch here at Urban have done have really drilled down to understand more about this problem. Um, but the bottom line is um, that uh, this is an area where um, I think there's the biggest risks from just using the microdata without um, a lot of caution in terms of um, tracking non-group coverage, and that's such an important issue now with the Affordable Care Act's um, implementation of um, new health insurance exchanges and the provisional marketplace um, uh, tax credits for that coverage, um, that distinguishing who's getting what type of coverage and who's getting coverage through these new marketplaces and who has non-group coverage in general is an area uh, that much more difficult with this survey than with other surveys. So I'm ending on a negative note, uh, but I want to actually end on a positive note. I've included um, selected references from uh, many different projects we've done here um, to really emphasize what a phenomenal resource this survey has proven to be uh, for addressing uh, health insurance coverage, who has it, um, who doesn't, and um, how is that changing over time? And um, how does that vary uh, across states and within states? So with that, I'm going to turn it back to Mark. Great. Uh, thanks very much, Jenny. I guess maybe I'll start with a couple of questions that came in that are just sort of clarifying questions about your presentation. And uh, so one is, uh, Jenny, you showed a couple of maps towards the end. Uh, and somebody wanted to know what the geographic units were on those. They look kind of like pumas to me, but um, like on so these maps. It, well, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go back to 14. I'm wondering if it's those. We actually created um, 
we thought the Puma estimate was um, too small on it uh, for the work we were doing um, uh, to provide reliable estimates for subgroups. Um, so we created an estimate that built up from the Puma um, that's a combination of county, uh, super Puma, um, and um, I'd be glad I have a, um, a, a document that indicates how we did that and we indicated in that document what the units were and how we built up from the Pumas. Um, but they use the Puma as the building block, absolutely. Okay. okay, and for those who don't use the microdata, the Puma stands for Public Use Microdata Areas. Uh, those are custom geographies that the Census Bureau creates. So each has at least 100,000 people to protect confidentiality. Uh, and one other clarifying question for you. Um, somebody wondered, you, you mentioned editing, some editing, edited data, and, and someone wondered what variables you're using for your edits. Yes. Um, again, I'd be glad to um, send um, two different published papers that indicate the strategy we're using on that. Uh, Victoria Lynch um, is the, the lead on, in that work, and we're using information on household relationships, uh, whether um, our eligibility flag for uh, whether they're eligible for coverage, what their income is, um, and the coverage of other people in the family. That's a really important component of our edits. So um, cases where I'll give a, a, probably the easiest example um, where both um, the, the mom has um, Medicaid, um, the child is classified as having non-group coverage, um, and there's no indication um, that there's non-group coverage available in that household in terms of income, and they look like they're eligible for Medicaid and SHIP, that would be a case where we would edit to be um, public coverage, okay. for example. Okay. So they have to meet their, these decision rules that are set up um, where the balance of the other information on the survey uh, suggests strongly that the coverage was misclassified. Okay. Uh, and this question may have been covered in one of your presentations, but um, right now, where would coverage obtained through the marketplace fit if someone was answering a question on the ACS? That's a really, that's a good question. And yeah, without the ACS explicitly asking about the marketplaces, I think we don't really know right now how people will choose to answer that. I think people may put some of them in the non-group direct purchase. But I just don't really know. Jenny, do you have? I'm, what, so what I'm hoping is that um, our colleagues at Census will share what they're seeing, because they're now dealing with the 2014 data. And there were several million people who obtained coverage through the marketplace. Um, so I think it could be through write-in or through that uh, non-group question. But we really don't know. OK. Um, two questions came in about SEHI. Uh, one, someone asked whether or not you've used the SEHI data, and, and someone else um, wanted to know if, if you have used it. Um, do you have any advice about appropriate use of those estimates? I can, I can go first if you want, Jenny. Um, we have used SEHI data. That's the small area health insurance estimates that the Census Bureau puts out. I'll just give a really quick description. What they do is they use statistical modeling and they combine the ACS direct survey estimates of uninsurance and they combine that with administrative records. So what they're doing is they're essentially able to produce single year uninsured estimates for all counties that have um, greater precision than would be available from the direct ACS estimates. So, Let's see, so uh, say he provides uninsured estimates by age, sex, and um, poverty level at the county level. So I think, I mean, if you're interested in estimates by any of those categories for all counties in the U.S., I think they're a great resource. They're really easy to use because of the fact that they are model-based, so it's essentially kind of like fact finder tables, but a little simpler to, to access. And, and Joanna, I noticed that 
Um, Shay, because I think Sehi is a great resource. I, I'm glad someone raised that. I, I hadn't been thinking about that. We um, do consult it and, and have made use of the estimates there. But didn't you recently, I'm catching up on my reading, but didn't Shadak recently put out county level estimates too that are not model based, but they're based on multiple years of ACS data? I'm trying to, I'm not sure. I should be able okay, to I, that. I, I, <laughs> I mean, I know we definitely, we, uh, we just blogged about the SEHI estimates, uh, where they, the 2013 estimates were just released last week. Okay, okay. So um, I remembered seeing something, but um, okay. it, it's great that that program exists because it, it really does provide an advance of the um, estimates that are available from the you know data for multiple years. Um, I think a good, useful indication of how things are varying across the counties. Yeah, like you said, it's nice when you do get all of the estimates you know for every county in the U.S., which is great. Someone asked, someone notes that the ACS data are about a year or more behind the enrollment current enrollment estimates, and they wondered if there's any examples of agencies that have access to Medicaid administrative data that are being used to update the eligibility estimates in real time? So I'll take a pass at that, and then, Joanna, you should jump in. Um, you know, I think um, the American Community Survey, um, the, the, the fact that it, it's the, the new estimates are not going to be out until fall, and they will reflect the full 2014 calendar year. Um, is um, in a time of so much change um, uh, is, um, uh, I'm, I'm looking for a positive word, it's, um, it, it means that there's a real lag in what that, what that resource tells us about how things are changing. That said, the National Health Interview Survey has been releasing um, through its early release program estimates for 2014 on a quarterly basis and just this Tuesday uh, they put out estimates for the third quarter of 2014. Um, and um, we here at Urban have been um, uh, implementing an internet-based survey to do really rapid feedback, real-time monitoring. Um, and the HHS has been releasing Medicaid enrollment data. Um, and, and trying to provide a picture of how enrollment is changing across states um, between 2013 and 2014. So we have a lot of information out there. Um, I would love it if um, two things happened, if the Census Bureau got the resources to do an early release on the uh, American Community Survey, because um, it, it is such a large survey that we'd have a better idea of how things were changing at the state level uh, and um, even at the local level in some instances than we do from our other data sources. Or um, it would be um, very useful to have an indicator for, uh, on the file, on the public release file that uh, tells us when the, um, uh, um, when the interview was, was done during the calendar year. We know in 2014, from our own survey, we were in the field on a quarterly basis, that there was a big jump between December and March, another big jump between March and June, and then by the end of December, there was another jump. Um, and I, the concern, and, and I understand this at Census, is uh, that it's not set up to provide uh, valid monthly or quarterly estimates. Um, but from a policy perspective, it would be really helpful to have more information available like that. Uh, Joanna, what do you, what would you say? I think you covered it really well, Jenny. So I would just add that in terms of like doing research with the administrative records, I know that there is a lag by the time they get processed. For example, the Medicaid statistical information system, that takes a while by the time I think CMS does the processing before an agency like the Census Bureau would have um, those records to be able to do research with it. Um, question for either speaker. Has there been any work done around health insurance estimates by industry and occupation? Do you know? Yes. Um, so, Joanna, one of those two is on here, but not both, right? 
No, industry and occupation are both on here. Yes, people yeah. have used the data to look at that. It's just firm size is not on here, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. So you could drill down and look at um, pretty um, fine-grained um, occupational groups, mm -hmm. and, and I have seen work done with that. Okay. Uh, can either presenter speak to the state-level health insurance estimates from the NSCH, the National Survey of Children's Health, and how they compare with the ACS? Um, so the National Survey of Children's Health is another great resource, but it's not um, has not historically been an annual survey. Um, so I I haven't actually Joanna, have you guys ever correlated the uh, uninsured estimates from the National Survey of Children's Health and the American Community Survey? I mean, we, do, yeah. we do include that survey in the brief that I mentioned on one of the earlier slides where we sort of provide just a, the overview of all of the surveys that are available. So we do, I think, provide like sample size and information about the content of the survey, but I don't think we've done a whole lot with it beyond that. And I've used that survey because it has some great content, uh, but not to look at, um, uh, not to do coverage estimates, although um, Brendan Saloner, a, col uh, a colleague at Johns Hopkins, led a paper that used that survey to look at the impact of the immigration um, provisions on the Children's Health Insurance Program Reauthorization Act, so it it is being used analytically as well, you know, to address some policy questions. Um, but it hasn't really filled the niche of um, being kind of a survey of record on health insurance coverage for kids. Uh, a couple more questions we have time for. I think um, can can either of you speak to the challenge of working with ACS health insurance data for Native American tribes and reservations? And they especially they mentioned in particular the uh, how the Census Bureau defines uh, those insured under the Indian Health Services as, as counting as uninsured. Yeah, um, but that information is on the public use file. So for example, that is an issue that we felt we needed to address in our work on participation. Because um, the questioner is absolutely right, Indian Health Service is not counted as health insurance coverage. It's um, uh, it very important provider of services, but it, it doesn't kind of meet the bar for being health insurance coverage. Um, that said, when we started exploring take up of Medicaid and CHIP uh, across the country, across states and across groups, uh, we found um, that the Native American um, children uh, and adults were participating at lower rates, and that affected some of the state level patterns, for example, Alaska. When we went back and said, well, um, the need for coverage may be less among the groups that are using the Indian Health Service, um, and redid the participation estimates, taking that into account, it did narrow the differences. Um, and I do think that's an important, um, if, if folks are doing work on that population, it's an important issue to take into account. And I'll just add also that um, the race and ethnicity categories in the ACS are pretty detailed, so you can, you know, researchers can choose if they want to look at the American Indian Alaska Native population alone, or if you would like to broaden that and also include people who have selected um, multiple race categories. I, now I'm glad you brought that up because a colleague uh, put out estimates in December of this year that, for example, the Hispanic population, you know country of origin, uh, so is able to uh, look at that in more detail than we typically are able to, and to look at the Asian um, population by country of origin. And the ACS, while the content uh, isn't super rich, it does have a lot on language and mm -hmm. language spoken at home, and so that's another dimension that we've exploited and others have um, to understand subgroup differences. For those whose questions I didn't get to, I'm sure the uh, presenters would be happy to take those offline. Um, but, but looking ahead, uh, I know the Census Bureau is, is testing new questions on, uh, you know, based on the marketplace, uh, adding something about the marketplace uh, health coverage. Do you know when those questions might, are going to be added to the survey? 
I mean, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Jenny, they'll be testing it in the 2016 ACS content test, so would they then be, if they choose to add them, be in the 2018 ACS, I think? That was going to be what I would have guessed, uh, but I'm not sure. But I was just thinking, because when yeah, they added I, the health insurance questions originally, they tested them, I think, in the 2006 content test, and then they were available in 2008, so. That sounds right to me. Well, I want to thank everyone for participating in uh, today's webinar, and especially want to thank Joanna and Jenny for taking the time today to talk to us. Uh, for those who joined late, I, uh, this webinar was recorded, so uh, anyone who registers should get a link to the recording sometime tomorrow, and you'll be able to access it online. Uh, we're busy planning for an ACS Data User Conference that's going to take place uh, in May, so uh, we're not going to have any additional webinars before then, but we'll, we'll be in touch soon about, uh, after the conference, we'll be in touch about uh, future webinars. So thanks again for everyone for participating, and that concludes today's webinar.